So we're going to be talking with Brad Walker today. He is a coach, author, speaker, and stretching expert, and he's also a nationally ranked athlete. And today we'll be generally discussing about injury prevention and how to stretch if you do get injured. And then we will follow with the 15-minute Q&A. So um, thank you again, Mr. Walker, for taking the time to be with us. And I will, uh, I'll give you the floor now. I'll stop talking. Yeah, thanks, Logan. That's, uh, I really appreciate being invited along today. Um, love the opportunity to talk about stretching and flexibility. Um, and I'm glad you said we got some question time at the end. So um, that'll be good, too. Um, I know I asked you before the call, you know, what you wanted to talk about in regards to stretching and flexibility. Um, and you, you know, suggested that we talk along the lines of, you know, stretching for injury prevention and stretching for injury rehabilitation. Um, so I'm really glad that you sort of came up with those topics because they're, they're great topics. Um, there's a lot of uh, misinformation and confusion around those topics uh, as far as how to use stretching properly. Um, so, yeah, it's going to be great today to sort of um, go over a few of those misconceptions, um, have a look at some of the research <clears throat> and, um, yeah, sort of get some answers for you guys. So um, I suppose if we're going to look at stretching for preventing injuries and treating injuries, um, let's take the topic of stretching for injury prevention first. Um, dig into that a little bit, um, you know, find out what some of the research says and so forth, uh, and then we can um, uh, come back to stretching for injury rehab uh, later. Um, so I suppose if we're going to talk about um, stretching in regards to pre preventing injury, I think one of the first questions we need to ask is, does it prevent injury? Um, and there's a lot of conflicting research out there about um, the stretching does prevent injury or not. Um, so there's, uh, you know, quite a large amount of research that says, stretching doesn't prevent injury. Um, and there's also an equally amount of um, uh, research out there that says it does. Um, so, you know, which one is right? Are both right or are both wrong? Um, so if you dig into the research uh, around stretching for preventing injury, um, what you'll find is the two the, the research is grouped into uh, two, two camps, basically. Um, on one side, you have uh, research researchers who have used what's called acute stretching uh, as part of their research. And on the other side, you have researchers that have used what's called chronic stretching uh, as part of their research. So what is acute stretching? What is chronic stretching? So uh, acute stretching is defined as a one-off bout of stretching before exercise. So the researchers that use acute stretching as part of their research typically uh, break their um, groups uh, or break their uh, research into two groups. Um, a lot of this research has been done on runners. Um, so what they'll typically do is they'll get two groups of runners. Uh, one group of runners will do no stretching at all. And the other group of stretching will do, for example, a 15 minute stretching routine before they run. <clears throat> and uh, that routine might involve say five different stretches, uh, maybe a stretch for the calves, for the hamstrings, odds for the glutes and the lower back, so typical sort of uh, muscle groups. Um, and they'll, they'll monitor the two groups over a course of uh, six weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks, <clears throat> and they'll look at the injury rates between the two groups. So that's the research that focuses on acute stretching. Other hand, you've got a group of research that focuses on chronic stretching. <clears throat> and chronic stretching is a program of stretching, <clears throat> excuse me, um, performed over the long term. So again, they'll typically work with runners. <clears throat> they'll have two groups of runners. Uh, the first group will do no stretching. And the second group will do a program of stretching over a period of time. So they might do uh, three sessions of stretching, uh, three sessions of 15 minutes uh, of stretching. Um, and the stretching is separate to their running workouts. Um, so, and they'll do that over a course of say six weeks, uh, eight weeks or 12 weeks. Um, and they'll, they'll then again, they'll monitor the injury rates of the two different groups. Um, so you've got two camps there. So um, before I tell you which, which camp works and which camp doesn't work, do, does anyone want to take a guess as to, um, you know, which, which type of stretching works best for injury prevention? Is it acute or chronic? Which, uh, which, which one would you assume to be the most beneficial? Maybe chronic. Chronic, yeah. Yep. Chronic too. Yeah, yeah. So you're definitely right there. So, um, <clears throat> so what the research is telling us, both research is, is giving us information on the right way to use stretching. Um, so um, acute stretching, that one-off bout of stretching, really doesn't have any effect on whether you get injured or not. So doing a few stretches 
or your exercise is not going to make a big deal. Um, and what the research has actually found is that the more intense you do those stretches, so the more you push those stretches before you do the exercise, the more chance you've got of getting injured. Um, so the research is telling us that the best way to use stretching for injury prevention um, is to use it in a, in a chronic way. So um, if, you, if you compared it to, stretch, uh, to strength training, um, there's a lot of similarities there. Um, you know, if you, if you were to do just a 15-minute session of strength training before you played your sport, you wouldn't assume that's going to do much for you. Someone told you that you should do 15 minutes of, of squats and lunges and jumps and sit-ups before you go play your sport, um, <clears throat> especially, you know, right before you run onto the, onto the sports field, that's really not going to have an effect on whether you get injured or not. <clears throat> but if you do a strength training program over the long term, uh, you know, maybe you do <clears throat> uh, three sessions a week of strength training, you would expect that over six weeks, eight weeks, tw 12 weeks, you would develop strength, you'd get stronger in, pat in particular joints and muscle groups, and that would contribute to reducing your susceptibility for injury. And it's exactly the same with stretching. So anyone who tells you that <clears throat> um, doing a few stretches before you run onto the sports field is going to help you um, is is um, you know um, is is not correct. That's uh, not what the research is telling us. So now we know <clears throat> how to use stretching to um, uh, prevent injury. Let's look at the different types of stretching because it's really important that. Um, we understand the different types of stretching that are available to us. Um, we understand the advantages and disadvantages of using each particular type. Um, so it's really important to have an idea of the type of stretching that works best. So typically, stretching exercises are broken into two main groups. You have static stretching exercises and you have dynamic stretching exercises. So whatever type of stretching you do can, be, can always be grouped into one of those particular groups. So... You may be familiar with some of the uh, particular types of static stretching. You have your traditional static stretching where you just get into a stretch position and hold that stretch. Um, you have things like assisted or uh, passive stretching where you use um, a partner or some sort of um, stretching tool to help you do the stretching. Um, other types of static stretching include active stretching um, where you use the opposing muscle groups um, to stretch uh, a particular muscle group. Other types of uh, static stretching include PNF. So you may have heard of proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation. Um, that's a type of static stretching. And even within PNF, you have a number of different types of PNF stretching. You have traditional PNF stretching. You have contract relax antagonist contract stretching, which is a form of PNF stretching. Um, you have uh, muscle energy technique. You have post isometric relaxation. Um, so these are all variations of the PNF technique. Um, and lastly, you have uh, isometric stretching, which, which is another type of static stretching. Um, so you have a whole range of different types of stretching, uh, static stretching group. Now, within the dynamic stretching group, you have things like traditional dynamic stretching, which are things like leg swings and arm swings. Um, you have ballistic stretching, which is a, a it's, it's a more forceful type of dynamic stretching. Um, it's not typically recommended today. Uh, it was very popular uh, years ago, <clears throat> where you had um, calisthenic type exercises where, um, you know, the, the limbs were sort of violently thrown around and, and you know, excessively high uh, leg swings and kicks and all that sort of stuff. Um, but we don't typically recommend ballistic stretching today uh, because it can be a little bit dangerous in regards to, um, you know, injuring muscle groups and so forth. Um, other types of dynamic stretching include active isolated stretching. Um, that's another type of stretching that uses um, small pulsing type movements over time. So you might do uh, 15 pulse type movements where you move into the stretch, hold it for a second or two and come out of the stretch and then go back into the stretch and come out of the stretch. Um, and you can do that sort of 10, 12, 15 times. Um, other types of um, dynamic stretching include things like resistance stretching and loaded stretching. So these are all different types of um, um, dynamic stretching. So the important thing to note here in regards to the different types of stretching is that there's no one best type of stretching. Um, I've often heard people get into conversations and debates over what type of stretching is best. PNF stretching is the best type of stretching or dynamic stretching is the best type of stretching. It's not about um, <clears throat> what type of stretching is best. They all have their own advantages and disadvantages. 
Um, for example, some types of stretching are more beneficial for warming up and sports performance. Um, other types of stretching are more beneficial for uh, injury rehabilitation and recovery. Um, and other types of stretching are more beneficial for uh, improving range of motion and flexibility, et cetera. So it's really important that you um, don't get too focused on, on coming up with one best type of stretching, but rather match the type of stretching to the goal you want to achieve with the client and the individual that you're working with. Um, so for example, uh, if you're working with a client <clears throat> and the sole aim is to improve flexibility and range of motion, then you're much better off going with static type stretches. So traditional static stretching, uh, PNF stretching is one of the best types of stretching for improving range of motion. Uh, there's plenty of research out now on um, uh, comparing different types of stretching and their effects <clears throat> on range of motion. And PNF stretching always comes out on top. <clears throat> um, if, for example, uh, you're working with an athlete and a sports person um, and you want to prepare them for a sports performance, then you're much better off with dynamic type stretches. So it's really important to be able to understand, <clears throat> uh, you know, the particular advantages of each type of stretching and then match the type of stretching to the goal that you want to achieve um, the client. So when it comes to um, stretching for preventing injuries, what type of stretching is best for that? Um, well, the answer is both, both static and dynamic. And that's because um, athletes both need static flexibility and dynamic flexibility. And depending on the sport that they do, some need more dynamic type flexibility and some need more static type flexibility, but they both do need both. Uh, in fact, <clears throat> Both types of flexibility complement each other. So um, the more static flexibility you can develop means you'll have greater ability to develop dynamic flexibility um, and vice versa. They really complement each other. Um, so it's really important that when you're looking at creating a stretching program for athletes uh, in regards to um, injury prevention. Um, number one, you're looking at chronic stretching. So you're looking at long-term stretching, uh, you know, over the course of weeks, months, et cetera. Um, and you're including both static and dynamic stretching exercises. Um, so that's really important when it comes to, um, you know, the type of stretching to use. Now, in regards to um, what stretches are best, because a lot of times I'll get questions around, um, you know, what, what stretch is best for the hamstrings or what stretch is best for chest. Um, in regards to that, I don't typically recommend a particular stretch. Oftentimes people will ask me to do a like a full body stretching routine. Um, <clears throat> and I don't I don't typically do that because it doesn't address the specific needs of the client. Um, a much better way to approach it is to look at the specific requirements of the individual. So firstly, looking at where are they restricted, um, doing some sort of an assessment on them to find out where are they restricted, where do they have tight spots, where do they have, have restrictions, where do they feel like they're tight and lacking flexibility. Uh, and then we look for things like imbalances. Are they more flexible on one side of the body compared to the other side of the body? Are they more flexible uh, in the front of their body compared to the back of their body? Um, so we look at these things and then we put together some stretches that are specific for that particular client. Um, and then obviously we look at the particular sport that they're doing as well. So if they're doing uh, running or cycling or swimming, or if they're doing um, some sort of a team sport like baseball, where maybe they're the pitcher, um, we look at the specific requirements of their sport. And then we put together some stretches specifically for number one, their limitations, their restrictions, their imbalances. And then secondly, for their particular sport. Um, okay, so that's, I, I had a couple of notes for, um, you know, talking about stretching in regards to preventing injury. Um, and I pretty much covered uh, most of the things that I had written down there. Um, so let's move on to stretching uh, for recovery, because um, that's another important part of, you know, how to, uh, how to use stretching to uh, improve recovery and speed up people's recovery. Uh, and then we'll open up for questions and, um, yeah, we'll get to any questions that you've got. So um, in regards to stretching for recovery, it's another area that um, often has some misinformation around it. Um, <clears throat> firstly, I want to make it very clear uh, about the type of injuries that we're talking about. So um, in regards to using stretching, um, we're not talking about injuries that involve bones. We're not talking about bone breaks. We're not talking about uh, concussions. We're not talking about head injuries, spinal injuries, uh, anything like that. <clears throat> we're typically talking about traditional sports injuries, uh, overuse type injuries, chronic type injuries, 
Um, injuries that affect the soft tissues, so things like uh, muscle strains, uh, ligament sprains, uh, bruises and contusions, those sort of things. So it's really important we're clear about type of injuries that we're talking about, type of injuries that stretching can help with. So in regards to those traditional type sports injuries, it's really important to note that um, during the first 48 to 72 hours of an injury, it's really important that you don't stretching, that you avoid stretching. So typically during those first 72 hours, um, typically called the inflammation phase of the injury, uh, you've got a lot of swelling, uh, you've got a lot of blood flow to the injury, you've got a lot of inflammation in that area really important that you don't do any stretching, um, which will put a lot of extra strain. So it's really that um, you avoid any type of stretching during 72 hours. <clears throat> Once you've got past that first 72 hours um, and you've started to see some of the inflammation go down, uh, some of the um, acute pain associated with the injury uh, has started to subside, uh, maybe some of the redness and tenderness has gone out of the injury, um, then you can start some very gentle stretching. And what I recommend for the first sort of 10 to 14 days is you stick with very, very gentle, very, very light, static and assisted stretching. So that's the type of stretching you just get into the stretch position and you hold it for 20, 30, 40 seconds or so. Um, and the, the key point here is very gentle, very light. Be trying to extend range of motion around the injury all you're trying to do is just get some mobility back into the injured area. Um, you want to stop it from sort of constricting, uh, constricting and um, shortening up. And all you're doing is just trying to get some of that natural range of motion uh, back. You're not trying to push the stretching. You're not trying to achieve a new level of flexibility. This early stage of the injury, um, you're just trying to get some mobile, uh, mobility back into the injured area. <clears throat> So after you've um, had about a couple of weeks with just very light, gentle stretching, uh, you can move on to some more intense stretching. <clears throat> I recommend that you use PNF during the next, say, two to five weeks. Um, and the reason for that is that PNF stretching, um, while it helps to develop flexibility, it also helps to develop strength within the muscle group that you're working on and the joint that you're working on. Um, so starting off with very light, gentle PNF stretching, That'll help to develop some strength or get some strength back into the injured area and also help to develop some flexibility around the injured area. And then long term, you're looking at getting back to this type of stretching that you were doing for your particular sport. Um, so that's including some dynamic stretching, um, getting back into some more intense stretching and basically getting that injured area to the point where it's as strong or as flexible as it was before you got injured with it. Um, now, I always make the point in regards to working with injuries is do have an injury, you want to develop, um, you want to debilitate that injury to the point where it's stronger and more flexible than it was before the injury. So, um, you know, typically <clears throat> if you do develop an injury, uh, apart for, from sort of acute type injuries where you maybe sprain an ankle or something like that, uh, but for the most part, um, you know, long-term chronic in injuries develop because you either have some sort of weakness in that area uh, or you have some imbalance or something's going on there. Um, so it's really important that you don't just get the injured area back to where it was before it was injured, but you, you know, go beyond that and develop it and, um, you know, rehabilitate it to the point where it's actually stronger and more flexible than it was before the injury. Um, so there's some points uh, in regards to, you know, how to use stretching to prevent injuries and rehabilitate injuries. Um, I'm pretty much done with the notes that I had for today. Um, so if we like to open it up, uh, more than happy to answer any questions you might have. I did have a question about, you mentioned ballistic stretching, um, and you said it's not really used anymore because it's not effective. Is there any scenario that you could think of where ballistic stretching would be used in any way? Yeah, yeah, there certainly is. Um, so the comment I made before, um, take that as a general comment. Um, I've, I've definitely worked with athletes that, um, you know, high level, uh, you know, talking Olympic level world champion type athletes, um, and they will use some pretty intense um, you know, dynamic stretching, um, you know, bordering on that ballistic type stretching where they are using, you know, extremely intense type movements. Um, so there definitely is a place for it. Um, we don't recommend it for the general population or most people um, but with, you know, highly developed athletes. Um, one of the reasons why we don't recommend it anymore is because uh, it can trigger the stretch reflex. Um, so the, the stretch reflex is just a defense 
system that the body uses where the muscles are overstretched, uh, the body will employ the stretch reflex, which basically contracts the muscle group. So for most people doing ballistic stretching, it will trigger the stretch reflex. Uh, but for, you know, well-conditioned athletes and sports people, um, extreme levels um, before they start triggering that stretch reflex. Thank you. Uh, what was the, <clears throat> excuse me, what was the type of stretching where you used the opposing muscle group to assist? What was that called? Yeah, so that's called active stretching. Okay. Um, and it uses the principle of reciprocal inhibition. So that's where we contract muscle, uh, one muscle group to force the opposing muscle group to contract. Um, so for example, a, a fairly typical sort of active stretch is one where you're standing up and you simply raise one leg sort of straight up as high as you can get it. So you're using mm -hmm. the, quad, the, the, the quads to contract to do the stretching of the hamstring. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Uh, you also mentioned how like heat stretch, uh, stretching doesn't really help a lot. Like even if like, is that mainly if you're like bringing your muscles, like if you're stretching your muscles like really hard, that's where the injury can happen mainly? Yeah, yeah, very much so. There's actually quite a lot of research about, um, you know, doing stretching immediately before um, sports performance and activities and so forth. Um, and there's a lot of research that suggests uh, doing, you know, especially very intense uh, long hold static stretching uh, does impair performance, especially um, uh, performance in regards to sort of explosive and power type activity. So jumping, bounding, sprinting, running, that sort of stuff. Um, so doing that intense long hold static stretching immediately before those power based activities definitely has a negative effect on performance. Interesting. Um, and then like, is there any point where like acute stretching could help or is it mainly just chronic that is really helpful. Yeah, chronic is the is definitely the far superior uh, type of stretching when it comes to long term uh, gains. Um, so obviously, we do use a little bit of um, acute stretching as part of a warm up. Um, but when it's part of a warm up, and that acute stretching is followed up with some sort of dynamic uh, type activity as well, those negative effects of the acute stretching um, are sort of wiped away as long as they're followed up by some sort of dynamic stretching or sort of sports specific drills and that sort of stuff. So in regards to warming up, we recommend that you do your static stretching very early in the warm up procedure. Um, so for example, if you've got like a 20 minute warm up planned, uh, you might start off with some just very gentle aerobic type activity, um, throw in a little bit of of, uh, just light, gentle, static stretching. Um, again, just to get some mobility into the muscles and joints. Um, it's not about trying to extend your flexibility as part of the warm up. That's not what the warm up is for. Um, so you would do some general aerobic activity, a little bit of static stretching early on in the warm up procedure. And then as you get towards the end of the warm up, you would start to include more sort of sports specific drills, uh, dynamic type stretching, dynamic type activities, that sort of stuff. Yeah, so that's the that's the warm up, just static stretches, and then towards the end, it's dynamic for sure. Yeah, definitely. Um, as, as as long as you're doing those static stretches early on in the warm up procedure, and you're following up with some sort of dynamic, sport specific type stuff, um, it's fine to include a few static stretches. Cool. Is it also good to just do all dynamic, like? <clears throat> Um, you can. Uh, I find with most of the athletes I've worked with and myself personally, um, I find it good to start with a little bit of static stretching. Um, it sort of just gets the body, uh, you know, starts to loosen up those muscle groups. Um, and then you seem to get sort of a, a much better result from the dynamic stretching you do later on because you've already got the muscles loosened up a little bit. Um, and that static stretching seems to complement the dynamic stretching you do later on. Cool. Thank you. Uh, I had a question in regards to like uh, static stretching. So like, you know, static stretching, you would increase flexibility in the, like in those end ranges kind of like, for example, I'm thinking maybe like the splits or something, but would that like lead to a possibility of increased injury, like in those end ranges? Cause you don't have strength there. Yeah, that's actually a, a common problem uh, with a lot of people who focus very heavily on stretching and flexibility and neglect the strength side of things. Um, I've seen a lot of that with um, people who uh, do a lot of yoga. Um, obviously, there's a big focus on the stretching and flexibility side of things with yoga um, and not so much on the strength and conditioning side. 
Um, so that is that can be a really big problem. Um, another reason why I like PNF stretching so much is because of the strength component to it and definitely strength at that end range of movement. Um, so it's, it's surprising, you know, having worked with so many people, um, it's really surprising how weak people can be at those end ranges of movement. Um, and I'm talking about athletes and sports people who you would typically think of as being extremely strong and, and they are, um, but get them in those end ranges of movement and they really don't have a lot of strength around those joints. Um, so, yeah, it's really important to focus not only on flexibility, but on strength as well. Um, I've always found that the two complement each other really well. Um, I know um, from experience that if I have a client and I'm having trouble uh, improving their flexibility in a certain muscle group, I'll get them to do some strength training on that particular muscle group. And once they develop some strength in that muscle group, it's just so much easier to, to then develop some flexibility in that muscle group. Um, so they definitely do complement each other. Cool, thanks. Yeah, because I was going to ask as well, like about training the end ranges, but sounds like PNF stretching is a good, a good way to do that. Yeah, for sure. PNF stretching is, you know, by far the best way to do that because you've got the client at their end range of movement and then you're getting them to contract uh, at that end range of movement. Um, so, yeah, that's a really good way uh, to at least start training those end ranges of movement, um, get some strength in there, and then you can sort of go into the gym and develop some sort of more specific strength orientated work for, for those end ranges of motion. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, so with a chronic injury, I was wondering, is it better to stretch for like a longer period of time with obviously like less intensity? Um, how would you kind of work with that? Yeah, that's definitely always my recommendation. Um, one of the mistakes I see people making a lot with flexibility training uh, is just the intensity of the stretching that they're doing. They're just stretching way too hard and way too intensely. Um, it's almost like uh, stretching in this way in particular is the opposite to strength training. So with strength training, you're always trying to push more. You're always trying to lift more. In stretching, it's almost the opposite. It's, it's almost like the easier you do the stretching, the more gentle you do it, the more relaxed you are, the better the result you'll get. So yeah, I always recommend it's much more beneficial to stay in the stretch for longer at a lower intensity. Gotcha, thank you. You say much longer at a lower intensity, how much longer and how much lower of an intensity? So I hear stories of gymnastic students where they'll be in the splits and then their coach or one of the other students actually pushes them down deeper into the splits. You know, that's obviously a very aggressive form of stretching. What would be the exact alternative? Yeah, good question. Um, so in regards to the intensity of the stretch, I recommend people aim for about a six or seven out of 10. So if zero is no stretch, and 10 is the point where it's actually getting painful, you want to be about a six or, the, six or seven out of 10. So you've got some good tension there, but it's in no way painful or hurting or anything like that. Um, in regards to the time frame, you're looking at between 45 and 60 seconds is, is really good. Now, longer is better up until, um, up until a point. Um, so what the research tells us is that up until about two minutes, after two minutes, you start getting diminishing returns. Still some benefit for holding the stretch longer than two minutes, but returns you're going to get for it start to diminish. Um, so 60 seconds is ideal. Uh, if you're happy to sit in the stretch for a little bit longer, up to two minutes, um, then that's fine. But I really don't recommend anything more than two minutes. And then is it advisable to split the stretching into two sets so it's two sets of 30 seconds or is it better for a single set of 60 yeah better for a single set of 60 um but yeah you could do two sets of 60 if you wanted uh but yeah it's that time in the stretch that's uh really gonna really gonna make the benefit and then forgive me if you covered this earlier i jumped on this call about 10 minutes late because i just got out of the meeting how exactly do you recommend performing PNF stretching? Because I've heard about seven or eight different opinions on that, and they're all very different. 
Yeah, so <clears throat> look, it's an interesting topic. Um, there's definitely some leeway in regards to, uh, you know, how you do your PNF stretching. Um, so, I mean, the, the, the way I do it is that I get the client into the stretch position and then I get them to hold for about 10 seconds. That just allows them to relax a little bit, allows the muscle group to relax um, and allows them to get ready for the contraction. So once they've had about 10 seconds in that stretch position, then I get them to contract for about five or six seconds. Um, the intensity of the contraction doesn't have to be so extreme. Um, again, using our sort of example of zero to 10, um, the intensity of the contraction only really needs to be about a four or a five. There's a lot of research on the best intensity for PNF stretching, and there's there's no real benefit for pushing the intensity uh, anything past about a four or a five. So I get them to contract into me for about five or six seconds. Then I get them to relax and we go to a new level of flexibility and then I hold it there for about 20 to 30 seconds. So that's where you're going to get the real benefit or the real increase in range of motion. It's those 20 to 30 seconds after the contraction that really allows the muscle group to relax and lengthen out as much as possible. Um, in regards to how many PNF cycles I'll typically do, um, Two to three is about ideal. Um, again, any more than that, and you start to get diminishing return. So that's how I've done it. That's something I've sort of um, developed over time um, through sort of reading the research material and sort of through personal experience and, you know, experimenting with athletes and so forth. Um, so that's, that's what I recommend. And that's what I found sort of works the best for me. Um, so I kind of, I had a question, would you recommend for just like the normal, the average person, um, would you recommend stretching like as soon as you wake up in the morning or like during the day or like maybe once a night or maybe both, what would you, what would you say? Yeah, look, there's a couple of different recommendations there. Um, firstly, it is important that you do some sort of warm up before you do any stretching. Um, so maybe not jumping out of bed first thing in the morning and going straight into some intense stretching. That's probably not the best way to do it. Um, so in regards to stretching to improve flexibility, there's a couple of sort of suggestions that I uh, that I have for people. Um, firstly, a good time for that is a couple of hours after your workouts. So that typically gives your body enough time to sort of cool down, relax, uh, get over the workout that you've done. But there's still some uh, some warmness in the body. There's still some mobility there from the exercise you've done, uh, and that that typically good time to do flexibility training. Um, the other time that I recommend people do flexibility training is late at night before they go to bed. Um, so this works at a couple of different levels. Um, firstly, it works at a uh, at a neuromuscular level. It's the last thing the system remembers before going to sleep. So that range of motion, the last thing the system remembers. Um, so over time, that range of motion becomes your new normal. Um, the other thing too is while you sleep is um, is when most of the healing occurs within your body. Um, so your muscles are healing at elongated state. Um, so that's what I find. That's what I recommend with most of my athletes, uh, that they finish the day, um, sit on the floor in front of the TV for half an hour before they go to bed and do their flexibility training then. Very interesting. Um, I just want to say real quick, you said uh, stretching a couple hours after the workout. So um, is it okay if you stretch like right after your workout or is it better to stretch a couple hours after? Um, you'll get more benefit from stretching a couple of hours after, about two hours after your workout. Um, in regards to stretching straight after your workout um, as part of the cool down, um, you can certainly do some stretching there. Uh, again, I find a lot of the time people stretch way too intensely as part of the cool down. Uh, you've got to remember you've just finished a workout. Uh, your muscles are already fatigued. Uh, and if you try and do intense static stretching after your workout, uh, there's a high likelihood that you could injure, uh, injure yourself. Um, so if you are going to do a little bit of stretching after your workout, again, be very gentle, very relaxed, very light. Remember, the cool down is not time to try and improve your flexibility. Um, the cool down is there to help your body relax and recover over the workout you've just done. So you don't want to be pushing your stretching at all. So if you're going to do any stretching, keep it very light, very gentle, um, 
And uh, yeah, just work on sort of getting back your natural range of motion rather than trying to extend your range of motion or push your flexibility. Gotcha, thank you. Uh, I had a question in regards to, again, like static stretching. If you don't train those uh, end ranges, is it likely that you'll lose that flexibility? Like, is does the strength in those end ranges, is that what it takes to maintain that level of flexibility? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, um, you know, stretching is is uh, just like any other type of fitness. Um, if you don't uh, keep up with that stretching training, the benefits of it. Um, just like any other type of type of uh, type of fitness, you know, if you don't do strength training, you'll lose your strength. If you don't do cardio, you'll lose your cardio. Um, it's exactly the same with flexibility. If you don't keep on top of it. Um, you know, you will lose it over time. Uh, one of the good things with flexibility that I've found is once you've developed your flexibility to a certain point, it is relatively easy to get back to that level of flexibility. Um, so, for example, you know, it might take you 12 months to get to the point where, um, you know, you can touch your toes, for example. Um, but it, it should only take you, you know, if you have a break for a while and you lose that flexibility again, um, you should be able to gain that flexibility back relatively quickly. So it might only take a month or two to get back to that level that you've developed in the past. I think I think I have one more question. Yeah. <clears throat> I don't know. This may be tough to answer, but like in my own experience, um, I do like a lot of static stretching. And if I don't stretch for a few days, I find like my body feels like very stiff and kind of like uh maybe weak i guess but i've but i've had like talked with friends and who have never like felt that way they don't ever stretch and they don't ever feel like real stiff and tense but i always feel that way i wonder if you had any insight onto like what that may be or or something yeah yeah look it's a funny thing i've you know i've heard um similar comments in the past and uh you know for myself personally uh because i've stretched for uh, you know a lot of my years um i know that if i go without stretching for a few days i definitely feel you know that tightness and that stiffness um you know maybe the people that don't stretch um maybe they're just used to that level of tightness and they don't really realize you know maybe how tight they are uh, in particular joints um i know from working with the general population a lot um oftentimes uh, you know i'll work on people and um you know i'll find a particular area that's quite tight uh, you know, but they they never realized it was tight. They never thought it was tight. Uh, it was just normal for them. So um, I think it's probably comes down to a bit of body awareness. Uh, you know, the fact that you're sort of clued into how your body feels and how your body responds to stretching and, and what good flexibility feels like. Um, you're sort of aware when uh, you lose a little bit of that flexibility and so forth. So I think it's probably more just an awareness thing. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'd always kind of wondered about that. So appreciate you giving some insight. All right. Well, um, Mr. Walker, thank you very much. This was, this was awesome. Uh, super informative and thank you for taking your time out too. Cause I, I assume you're a pretty busy guy. So, uh, very much appreciated. Yeah. Thanks Logan. I, as I said at the beginning, I always enjoy talking about my, my favorite topic. So I appreciate the opportunity to come here and talk with you. Um, I'm always available for questions. So if you guys have got questions in the future or you think of something that, uh, or, you know, maybe you hear something or read something that, um, you know, you want a second opinion on or some clarification on, um, I'm always, you know, pretty willing and able to answer any questions. Um, get in contact with me at my website, just stretchcoach.com. Uh, there's a contact form there. You can uh, ping me, get in touch with me, send me an email uh, and more than happy to answer any more questions that you've got. Awesome. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for coming on. I appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Thanks, thanks for having me.